So hello and welcome to the special roundtable discussion. I'm Bob Giuliano, the president of the college. Hard as it is to believe we're actually now in our fourth week of remote learning, a transition that was obviously made necessary by virtue of the global pandemic. Boy, it's been a bit of a whirl. The faculty had only a couple of weeks in which to rethink their curriculum and to determine how best to teach in a very different way, at least through a very different format than the one they were accustomed to doing so. Uh, for our students, they had to make the same transition to learn how to adapt to a different way of taking in information, all at the same time that all of us were adapting to a very different uh, world um, and a very different way in which we live, work, and study. We now have a little bit of breathing space. It's been those three and a half weeks since we started this. And so I think it's instructive for us to take a moment to step back a little bit and to reflect on what we've learned to date. What's working? Uh, what's not working as well? Uh, how can we make sure that the remainder of this semester um, is as good as it can possibly be for our students uh, and for the community as a whole? And so joining me today are two Gettysburg College students, Akilah Brown, who is a sophomore political science and philosophy double major and a business minor, and Julia Coddington, a senior organizational management studies major and political science and Middle Eastern studies double minor. Uh, welcome to the two of you. We also are joined by two members of our faculty, Veronica Covillo, Associate Professor of Spanish, and Joseph Brandauer, the Director of the Johnson Center for Creative Teaching and Learning, and Associate Professor of Health Sciences. Thank you all for joining us today. Joseph, let me start with you, only because I suspect many people won't know exactly what the Johnson Center is. Can you say a word or two about it and um, how the role it's played as we've made this rather abrupt transition to remote learning? Yeah, so the Johnson Center for Creative Teaching and Learning is one of uh, a number of cent such centers around the nation in different universities and colleges. And our job, our role on campus, is to facilitate better teaching among our instructors and a better educational experience for our students. That's really our job description. And what we do, or how we do is, uh, this is by connecting individuals, course instructors, um, staff, administrators, and students, and we facilitate conversations, collaborations, and exchanges of ideas about creative and innovative and successful teaching strategies. So, so a big part of our job is to make sure that people don't reinvent the wheel in a time of limited resources. And we are fortunate in this sense at Gettysburg because there's an incredible amount of knowledge already existing on this campus, where now it's dispersed uh, in the countryside surrounding the college. Uh, and so it's been really rewarding to be a part of the process of making those better teachers. How have you, how has it, what role has it played as we've made this particular transition? It has definitely been a, what we now effectively refer to as a pivot for us as it has been for everybody else. Everybody had to step into a all hands on deck situation, think about what was urgent and what had to be prioritized. And we've done the same thing. So as we have pivoted to emergency online instruction, our needs have changed. The needs of our instructors have changed. And most importantly, the needs of our students have changed. We have done our best to meet those needs however we can. Veronica, how have you found this transition uh, from the hands-on, you know, this is a very personal educational model that we think is central to who we are. How have you found this transition to be? Certainly we had to, like Joseph said, all hands on deck. And coming from trying to make, I mean, I'm, we're grateful that we had extended um, spring break, right? And that we had at least this week to sort of gather ourselves together and uh, collect ourselves together in terms of what was coming, um, this remote learning. And so I think, uh, it's been, uh, it's been a ride, but um, luckily we relied on our department and um, we have been able to collaborate with each other, help us help each other out, uh, figure out how we're gonna put this together for the best uh, education that we can offer uh, under the circumstances and for also all keeping in mind the, the best interest, which is our students. And I've done some podcasts recently with some faculty, including faculty in the sciences, and asked them how are they trying to make that adjustment 
to teaching online where some of the work needs to be more physical. What's it like teaching um, a language online? Have you found that there are particular challenges associated with that? Yes, uh, we have we have found challenges. Uh, one of the re which is one of the reasons why we have decided that most of us, at least in the Spanish department, uh, were going to offer our classes synchronized. It is so important for us and that the students maintain a contact with the language. And so one of the things that we had decided, and like I said, most of us are teaching synchronized. Uh, we wanted to still keep that community that we had in the classroom for students to have some contact with the language. And luckily, you know, having technology around has also been um, very nice because we get to explore other options that we hadn't explored before. So our student, our main concern, and we wanted to offer this, which is why we kept synchronized, was to have the students contact with the language, meaning we get to practice in class, we get to speak Spanish in the classroom, and then we use our technology and other things that we have set around for our students to practice other things, to practice their um, listening skills, their writing skills. Uh, there's so many things out there in the internet now that are uh, so useful right now under this circumstances. And another thing that I wanted to say also is that the publishing companies, at least for our 100 level class and our 200 level class, have been phenomenal in working with us. Um, as we know, a lot of our students have, um, didn't get a chance to get their belongings and therefore um, didn't have their textbook, which is an essential thing <laughs> to uh, learn uh, a language. And so the, uh, the um, publishing companies uh, lend out a hand and work with us uh, and then I just cannot be more grateful for that because they provided a textbook copy of it you know for them and so that I know that that eased a lot of the stress that the students were thinking like well how am I going to do this if I don't have a textbook and so we are taking this opportunity to re really make it a learning experience not just for the students but for us in terms of what uh, we don't know the circumstances. I mean, I'm hopeful that we'll be returning to campus and we would have this community that we have fostered in the classroom, but you know, we just have to be prepared. And this is a great opportunity to learn other ways to foster uh, learning a language and well, learning about the culture. We'll come back to some of that. Now from our students' perspective, um, how's it going? Let me start with you, Julia, because you're a senior. You and I, you and I have had a chance to talk and I've extended my deepest regrets that your senior year has been disrupted as it has been. But first, how are you doing? How's the adjustment going both personally and academically to this new way of learning? I mean, speaking for the class of 2020, I know that we're all very heartbroken. These past, or these next eight weeks, were really supposed to, meant to give us closure for our time at Gettysburg and with senior events, ceremonies, and experience our last undergraduate class along with our last meal at Servo. So things like that are definitely really hard because we lose those, um, that preparation that for commencement and really saying goodbye to Gettysburg as we know it and sent off into the world to start a completely new chapter. But I think we're really holding on to the fact that it, we will have one last time together on campus and, um, I think also the fact that we're so upset reflects how much we value our last four years at Gettysburg and how much, how special it has been to the growth that we've experienced. But um, I definitely think that I'm adapting as best as I can be. I'm considering the circumstances. I've been finding that it's essential to create a schedule and structure and try my best to replicate my typical day at school by putting in my classes and time for studying, time to work out, go outside and have Zoom and FaceTimes with my friends really lift spirits when you're inside all day. Um, so, and even academically, I think my professors have done a great job with being so accommodating and really understanding that students have very different environments and circumstances that they're in right now. Um, so I think that um, academically, they've done the best they've can. It's, there's t challenges that come with online learning, but so far, I think, considering the chaos that we're in right now, it's going as best as it can. So, Akila, you've come at this from, Julia had seven full semesters under her belt. You had completed three and was just working your way through the fourth. 
how's it going? First of all, how are you doing and how's it going for you as you, as you make this transition? I would echo some of the things that both the professors and Julia have mentioned. It's been hard, but um, it's been an interesting three weeks so far. Um, interesting in the sense that my professors are learning how to use Zoom and more technology than they probably ever used in the classroom before. We're also mutually figuring out how we're going to take tests, like I took an exam this morning, how that's going to be turned in, you know, how do we engage with one another based on discussion projects, whether or not we're still going to do group projects with one another and how to how basically that's going to pan out using tools like Zoom. So that's kind of been my biggest transition and my biggest focus, basically trying to learn from home. Um, at first I thought it was gonna be easy, being a millennial, being a, a child of technology, you would think that I would not hesitate to pick up my phone or pick up my laptop. But when you kind of have to be forced to do something, it doesn't seem to be the easiest thing to do, you know? When you have so much around you to distract you, there's television, there's all other vices, and when you're confined to your home, it's kind of a, a, a weird mixture of trying to figure out how, make, how to make sure you're balancing your schoolwork as well as your home chores or any other things that students may be dealing with giving this time. But um, overall, I feel that remote learning and the notion of transitioning to remote learning is a bigger concept than we're currently understanding or that we all can understand from the same perspective, at least, because in my opinion, I, I definitely think that the idea or the notion of a transition is a transition on, on many fronts besides our learning in the academic classroom, but for people that are going to homes that may not feel as homely as others' homes may be, or people that have to go places that they wouldn't have went given the unforeseen circumstances. There's a lot of things that many students have to kind of juggle all at once aside from not being able to have a, a textbook or go back to get a textbook and making sure that they're on top of things. So as Julia echoed, I, I think writing down a lot of things have helped me a lot, although it's better for your cognition to write down notes anyway, but um, than to use my phone or to use my laptop or leave myself to many vices that I, I normally would. So yeah, that's how I'm feeling so far. Very well said. The New York Times had an article recently, Akila, that talked a little bit about the, when we're all together, there's more of a shared experience as we disperse than the individual variations of one's home life and personal economic circumstances take on a heightened um, degree of importance. And one of the things we tried to do that partially addresses that, but only partially, is to be as careful as we could be about making sure that the technology wasn't the limitation. So as some of you all know, we sent out hotspots and laptops and other things to students to make it a little bit more possible to ensure that, again, there weren't technological limitations, but that doesn't answer all of the points that you began to raise. So students, you guys have two faculty members here. What would you urge them to change um, uh, based upon your early experiences here? Um, that's a great question. I, I think that one of the best tools that my professors have been using right now is the breakout room feature on Zoom, which fosters that small group discussion that is so central to Gettysburg's academic experience. And I think that's the best replication through our online platform right now. Um, it's so hard to maneuver the best way to teach right now. So I think that my professors have done the best they can. And I think the, the best way to replicate what we had at Gettysburg was just the small discussions and the collaboration and their interaction with students and professors is what makes Gettysburg's academic experience special, I think. I'd also say that being able to ask questions is kind of the biggest thing. Professors were doing that prior to the pandemic and having to remove to remote learning, but I think asking questions of your students, making sure everything is okay, the constant weekly updates of making sure that people are getting assignments done and, and making sure things are in order the way they're supposed to be. I may, may seem a little mundane to kind of track adults and you know adolescents to make sure that they're doing everything correctly or doing everything in a timely manner, but I think it's more um, imperative to do so simply because we're actually left to all technical devices which you're used to using on our daily basis, but it's kind of hard to kind of make sure that you're able to keep up with those things in the in the same manner you could have kept up with them on campus. And I say that to say that I go to Servo at a certain time, you know, my friends, I go to the library at a certain time to do my homework. And I'm not going to the library, I'm not going to Servo at this point. So my mom's Servo at this point, <laughs> and the library is like after I go outside for a walk. So these things are kind of different maneuvers that all students may not have the opportunity or, or yet the op ability to fully flesh out thus far in these three weeks. So just being in tune with the students 
both personally and academically, I think is really crucial. And I've been doing that, so please continue to. I would say the same thing. And also, I know that some students are, um, are finding it difficult right now to keep up with the um, adjustments in their syllabi and due dates and class assignments. So I agree with Akila that staying on, oh, just a reminder, in a week from today, you have your essay due is really great because there's so many other factors in everyone else's lives right now that everyone's just um, a little bit overwhelmed with the work and how they're going to complete that work as effectively and as at the same quality as they did at school. From the faculty's perspective, what um, advice would you have for students as, as they undertake this, uh, the last six weeks of this semester? My advice is give us feedback. And it, it fills me with joy to hear you say what you're saying because when we transition to this online model, the first week or 10 days, we were basically deciding which technologies are we going to use. And we focused, we limited it to three, to Zoom, to our content management system, and then to one um, software suite that allows us to record screencasts. And we did that because it, we thought it would simplify the preparation so we can have the personal connection, which are so time and labor intensive and emotionally intensive too. And so in the Johnson Center, we have been offering these really short and concise sessions. We call them 30 minutes with, and then we ask an expert from campus to talk to us about how to write papers and edit papers while you're in an online learning environment. And in the beginning, it was about how do we do the job well? First few pieces were about how to get the job done. And this week, it's been about supporting our students, maintaining mental health, helping each other make it through an emergency situation. And so that transition that you're saying, that you're commenting on, and the pieces are working, and my professors are still there for me as a human, that's exactly the same trajectory that we have followed in how we think about, okay, here's what we need, right? Now we're transitioning a little bit into next week, our next session is on team building. And it's about, okay, now I have some students, it's four weeks into this experience. I feel like some people are drifting away. How do we get them back in breakout rooms, personal touch points? And then we're four weeks in and then we really have the finish line in mind. So it's just really nice to see that we're really part of one group of people that are trying to accomplish the same thing. That gives me joy. Veronica, would you add anything? Yes, I think uh, constant um, checking in at the beginning of a classroom. I, the way I, I like to keep in contact with my students is that, you know, we start off like we start this meeting, how you're doing, uh, what's going on with your classes, uh, how many times are you meeting with your other professors, are you staying in contact with them, and just reassure them that we want the best for them. And the best way to do this is to continue that communication like we had in the classroom. And I think communicating and offering various levels of, uh, of media, of communication, not just through Zoom, having Zoom hours, um, office hours through Zoom. I, I particularly have a free conference calling um, account for me, so my students can reach out to me uh, during office hours. Uh, in case Zoom does not work for them, in case that the internet is not available for them, they can call me and send me an email and say, can, can, I, can I call you? Uh, you know, uh, without them feeling like I have to connect, I, I have the internet and I need this and I need to have the perfect space to have Zoom. And I'm like, no, don't worry about that. You know, and just constantly saying, you know, if something comes up, even at the end, at the beginning and at the end of each, each classroom, I think if we can remember that uh, to extend a hand for our students and say, let me know if something comes up, you know, just email me and say, I can't turn this assignment at this particular time. And, you know, we can, we can work together on, on coming through uh, whatever is it that uh, is going on at that time. So I think an open communication line um, is essential to making this uh, work as what uh, Julia and Akila have mentioned, you know, having that constant communication and say, how are you doing? 
I mean, hearing this just underscores what has always been true about this place and that it works because of the faculty's relationship with the students, the ability of the students to reach out to faculty and be able to have a real conversation with them, not just about the academic side, but about a set of other things that may, Joseph, you, you call the human level uh, as well. So it's not just an intellectual exercise. It's really a notion of community. Maybe that's the question. Is community being built at this moment in time? If so, how and what over the course of the next couple of months can we do to even further foster that? I think it has been built for years and we're seeing it come together now and we are focusing on the things that are really important. There's some things I think that we might criticize if we were all on campus and having lunch together, but we all realize that this, the things that don't matter, they don't matter and we, didn't, don't, we don't need to worry about them. But these conversations that Veronica is talking about how are you doing? Please talk to me if, you, if you're struggling. They don't happen out of a vacuum. They happen because a student trusts their professor or the person in the, the librarian or the person in academic advising or their counselor. And they come from really small, isolated, not meaning a lot conversations where you just, just express that you care about the person and you're interested in this person's uh, in the person themselves. And you build trust through a, through a lot of these smaller conversations. That takes so much time. And that is exactly what we do here. And the fact that it's working now, I think has two reasons. One, we have been doing this since I have been in Gettysburg for 11 years. This is always what we have done in my time here. And two, we have that accelerant that's being put onto that fire because we all realize how important it is to reach out now and to trust our students and for our students to trust, to trust us. And the conversations that I've had with my students have really reflected this. I have emailed every one of my students, much like almost all my colleagues, every one of my advisees, and I say, how are you holding up? And they say, they tell me how they're holding up and then they ask me how I'm doing. And that is such a rewarding and and welcome gesture in this time because a lot of the professors that we work with are struggling too. And so it's really coming together beautiful. I don't mean to embarrass Julia, but Julia signed up for office hours. And from what I can gather, the main purpose was simply to check in on me. So oh. um, <laughs> Julia, thank you for that. Of course, of course. What about from the student perspective? How have you all found the notion of community at this moment of time? And I know, Akila, from something you sent me last night, it suggests that you're in touch with a broader number of people as well at the college. So tell me a little bit about the whole notion of, from the student's perspective, how the community, if the community is being sustained, even though we're now dispersed. Um, I think the community is definitely being sustained, although we're all to our own homes and areas that we have to be confined to at the moment, but there's many different avenues that I've noticed that people are staying connected to one another. Um, I think Julie and I may understand this a little more, but like students are using our FaceTime or we're using Zoom to like watch movies together, you know, essentially sit next to my classmates and my peers in the same way that I would have sat next to them in the library or do my homework over a video chat. But one thing that was really interesting to me and that really brought me a lot of joy was a uh, email thread that was titled inspirational woman i'm not even sure who created it but essentially you'd put your name in a, a, a times place and you'd send another email to another female on campus whether it be a faculty whether it be a student and you send them an inspirational quote or you send them something that you love about a certain book and it was in essence to keep on inspiring and making sure that everybody was okay in a sense. So as the chain went on and on, you just tagged 20 other women that you can basically identify as leaders or people that would really need that inspiration at this current moment. And I felt that very valuable to the growth and the preservation of our community while being away from campus. Aside from all of that, I feel like many of the clubs have kept up with their members, whether it be through social media, just checking up on how we feel about the coronavirus and or how we feel about being in a remote area of learning rather than being on actual campus and engaging in those same activities. There's many different ways that we've kind of kept the community going and I truly appreciate it. Julia, what about from your perspective? Yeah, I think that um, thinking about it, it's funny because none of the things that I've been involved in on campus have been canceled. Everything has taken on a, a new avenue of continuing it. So for example, I do Big Brothers Big Sisters on Wednesdays afternoon and it wasn't canceled. We now just 
chat with our little sister or little brother over FaceTime once a week and also provide them the consistency. And I think that we're really lucky that we have technology because if we didn't, we wouldn't be able to foster the community and like Akila said, sustain it like we are right now without it. And so even setting up Zoom and FaceTimes multiple times a week with my roommates and my friends feels like we're together again and is often the highlight of our days because we're talking with people that are just our mom or our dad or our siblings. So um, I think that it's been going much better than I expected because everyone's very motivated to talk to each other and check in on how we're doing and all activities and clubs that myself and my peers are involved in, I know have just taken on a new way of conducting themselves. Well, keep it up because it is the defining aspect of this place and distance doesn't help. But one thing I was confident in going into this is that the students in particular would find a way to make sure that they stayed connected with one another. Um, so what surprised you all most about this transition? either on the positive side or the negative side? That is the thing that was easier than you expected it to be or that you found much harder than you expected it to be? I did expect some complaints because that's human nature and I've heard none. Everybody has really embraced their colleagues and their students from what I'm seeing. And I, I had, I'm an optimist and I have had high expectations and that really positively surprised me. On the somewhat negative side, I, I will consider myself an introvert and I do not mind spending time with myself and my thoughts. And the first week was really exciting because it was new. And at this, the second week was a significant struggle for me. I've been doing this job for a long time and it was incredibly hard. And it gave me some empathy for my colleagues who are extroverts and thrive on these direct social interactions. That must be that must be really hard, and so we've been thinking about it a, a lot more. Other thoughts? I would second that. I myself am, am an extrovert, so this has definitely been a very difficult time without having the constant social interaction like you do at school. Um, so that's been challenging, and I think that it's been challenging to be as focused and motivated to do our work at home. It just doesn't mimic the library or cub or other academic buildings that I know I can focus and get my work done in. Um, but on the positive side, I think that we've been able to realize the connections on a personal level that I have with my professors and knowing that they were very on top of everything. And like Veronica was saying, just checking in with us on a personal level and genuinely caring about how we are and how we're doing and that made me recognize more clearly how special my relationships are with my my professors other thoughts the most difficult part maybe not for myself but in review of my peers that i was able to <laughs> kind of solicit for feelings and experiences during um our three weeks now on remote learning is that not all professors given Professor Brandauer and Professor Colivio are, are, are quite adapting to Zoom very well, whether it be the students and the professors equally not understanding how to use the programming, equally not knowing how to make a lab, a lab transferable to something that's online. Um, even the notions of expecting as much as we did on campus in their homes, um, I'm not really sure and I can't really speak fully to how that translates in those classes, but I can identify how that can be difficult for certain students. But on a positive note, I feel that many of my professors have constantly questioned, and that's why I mentioned it before, and kept up with me in ways that I kind of found weird at first because I thought like, okay, paying a little more attention, you know, things are happening. But I definitely do value them questioning and making sure they're okay. And, and even sometimes in uh, one of my professors, lecture videos, she puts in a question and says, make sure you're stopping this video now, like as if there were still some actual person to person interaction. So things like that really keep my spirits up. Now, Akila, you're making me feel guilty about sending you an email earlier, congratulating <laughs> you and your award and then checking in on you. <laughs> no, it's okay. I just was like, all these people noticed me? But <laughs> it's crazy. I think, um, uh, you know, one of the hardest things for, for me has been also uh, not being able to interact uh, personally and like 
in the same room with my students. Um, in the Spanish department, are all most of our languages classes are very small. And so um, we do become like a family. I like to say that and they, I tell this to my students all the time. And so having them far away, you know, uh, I mean, I get to see, I have 12 students in, in uh, most of my classes. And so luckily I'm able to, I'm able to see their faces or hear their voices uh, through the Zoom um, screen. And so um, it brings me, it's the highlight of my, of my day having them there. Well, we all came to this place because of its intimacy at the end of the day, right? The faculty have come because they want to interact with students. You all picked not a 10,000 bo student body. You picked a place that's smaller and therefore gives the capacity to know your faculty member, know one another. So of course we're missing, I think, that, that connection that helps define very much who we are. But Yosef, I want to underscore the point. Um, the response of the community has just been phenomenal. Uh, from beginning to end, um, from students to the faculty to the staff to everybody, just sort of saying, "Okay, this is not the this is not the hand we wanted, but it's the hand we have, and let's figure out how to play it as effectively as possible." Um, to the students, do you think this whole experience will end up, um, Julia, in your case, influencing the way you think about what you want to do as you graduate? Akila, in your case, both that and how you think about how you want to spend the next two years on campus? I would say personally, this has not influenced the way or the career path that I am thinking about pursuing, but it definitely has reinforced what I already knew that I need to be with people. I need to, um, I'm most productive when I'm surrounded by people and foster personal connections with others. Um, and I think that Throughout all of this, I've realized you can, we can get through it as long as we are and with each other. I echo Julia on her point of it solidifying things I know about myself. Um, I feel like sometimes I'm an introvert, but it depends. But uh, at my heart, as I've spoken to you before, I do like civil litigation and civil justice. So I'm very much for the people as always. Um, it really just revealed things I already knew about myself, um, points of care and, and concern that I kind of keep at the forefront of whether I'm arguing it in the discussion or whether I'm constantly checking in to make sure they're all aligned or well taken care of. So yeah, it, it hasn't changed my career focus. If anything, just became a side note in um, why I feel I, I want to go into the path I, I do. I very much hope it does though um, get you thinking about coming back to campus and experiencing those connections in a different way. I think we all take it for granted like everything else until it's taken away from you. And then you realize, oh, this was really something that mattered. Uh, I hope that will be true for you, Akila. It will, <laughs> hopefully. Um, Veronica, will this change the way you teach? Uh, yes, <laughs> and, and yes, in many ways. I think um, having a relationship with my students is so important and I think mentoring them um, beyond the classroom is so important and so if anything I think it will strengthen the uh, um, my vision in terms of being a mentor to my students and caring beyond the classroom and asking them uh, finding more questions about them uh, knowing uh, reaching out more uh, sometimes some students don't don't want to do that you know they don't want to reach uh, whether it's because uh, culturally wise is not proper to reach out you know and so I think having a constant check-in with all of them regardless whether they have that door open I want to open the door for them so they feel comfortable and I think this has created uh, even more uh, of a reach out for them and say, you know, I'm here, uh, even if it's not me, uh, it can be somebody else. I think it's so important for a student, for faculty to have a go-to person, someone that you can reach out to. And even if it's not me, that's okay. I won't get my feelings hurt, but I always tell them, you know, just find somebody. Um, I know some students, uh, they, they're in the same town. And I say, you know, so-and-so is in, in, in Houston and so-and-so is in the same town that you're in. Have, you know, can you reach out and, and just keep tabs of each other? You don't need to call. You can just say, hey, 
what's going on? Uh, are you okay? And in that kind of community building outside of the classroom, I think right now is so important and so crucial to maintain those ties, uh, however, however we can. Thank you. Yosef, um, <clears throat> shifting gears just slightly, and that is, as you think about pedagogy um, and the role of the Johnson Center and the Johnson Center's interest in the use of technology, um, do you hope that there are things that emerge from this that will influence the way in which we think about teaching prospectively? I think so. I think our confidence as a faculty in using technology has grown exponentially because we have been forced to engage with technologies that we didn't have to. And now they're becoming a part of our regular teaching canon. So in my own case, for instance, I have been recording screencasts for years. They're basically small mini lectures that my students watch and then we can have it and then applied and animated discussion in in the classroom. And now I'm using those differently. I think I'm using them better because I was forced to really critically think about making it work in different ways. And so I see it in myself that now I'm using technology better two, three weeks in. And we're growing. This is what we do. We, we grow from these experiences and we come out better on the other end. And so there is, a, I think, this ethos at Gettysburg that you don't teach a class 10 times you see, teach it for 10 years. And every year you teach it, it's a better class. And that's what we do. This is just a different example of being challenged and, and rising to the challenge. So last question to the two students. Um, what advice do you have to your classmates who may be um, still figuring out how to be as successful as possible in the online remote environment that we find? ourselves in. What has really worked for you uh, and what advice would you leave them with? I would say for me, I've the thing that's been most helpful during this time is creating a structured schedule and creating routine for yourself because you're first of all able to be more productive, but it also provides some sense of normalcy and I think that's really important during a time that is completely uncharted territory. So I would say moving forward, setting time aside for yourself, for going outside, um, for your mental health, and making sure that you're exercising is really vital. But really having a set plan for your day can be very useful during um, online learning. Akilah, what about you? What are, you? what are your words of wisdom for your fellow classmates? Um, I wrote down three points. Uh, the first one would be to reset. Um, reset your day, reset your week, reset your hour. Um, by this I mean making sure that you're making sure your mental health is well, your physical health is well, those around you that you love and care about, whether it be your friends, your peers, even your president of your college <laughs> campus is doing well and safe during this time. Um, and even to reset your academics. So if you plan to do something today and you weren't able to finish it, like Julia mentioned, make sure that you're replanning, you're resetting, you're making sure that you start anew because even for me, that's one of my downfalls. I usually get myself down when I don't do something in a time frame that I've set for myself to do. But um, having the wherewithal to know that I have the ability to reset that time for myself rather than stump myself is something that would make sure that you foster your own positivity. Secondly, I would say to have hope and bring positivity to yourself and your environment in the best way you can currently. Um, so if that's getting dolled up and taking a couple photos of yourselves or calling your friends or even going out for a walk within, within reason now, um, <laughs> is something that you can do to kind of make sure that you're fostering your own happiness during this time because I think that's vital to both your academic success as well as your self-sustaining success given all that's going on in the world. And then lastly, I would very much advocate to be vocal. Um, this is a lot going on for all of us right now. And I think vocalizing your worries, vocalizing your experiences, as the professors have echoed, as, as you have echoed, um, is the only way that people can truly know what's going on with you or figure out where, where you are in um, a current predicament or where you are in comparison to others. So I think making sure that you find those people and find those mentors, find those peers that kind of uplift you or have your back and speaking to them to ensure that you're okay during this time is, is what's going to get us through the fall. 
I can't think of a better way to end the conversation. So thank you for that, Akila. And thank you all. Joseph, you said at the outset that after, after the students gave their comments, how it um, gave you joy. I will say, as I think about these challenging moments, just having this conversation and hearing the way in which all of you are approaching it, you're approaching it together, you're approaching it almost with a spirit of optimism, notwithstanding the really dark circumstances we find ourselves in, I find incredibly inspiring. And if you do what I do, getting up every morning, thinking about the college and its well-being, thinking about the work that you all do, makes it awfully easy to do what I do. So thank you. Uh, stay well, please. Plug away. It's what, six weeks left in the semester, I think? Do I have that right? Yes. So hang in there, guys. And um, uh, Julie, you will hear from us soon, I hope, on graduation. Thank you. Thank you guys so much. Thank you all. Thank you. Right. Thank, Thank you. you. Stay Come. well and stay healthy.